Okay, good evening. My name is TJ McDonald, and welcome to the launch of a new series hosted by Pace Athletics. I we'll love the sport, and tonight's topic is Let's Talk Baseball. Just one housekeeping tip and a couple of disclaimers before I introduce our guest panelists. We have muted all, everyone, but we welcome questions. So for those that know how to use Zoom, please submit your questions via chat, and we hope to get to all of them this evening. We will be recording the session and we hope that there are no Zoom related technical issues for you or us. This evening we were joined by Pace alumni guests across several decades. Former and current Pace setter baseball, softball players, student athletes from other sports, as well as parents, friends, Pace staff and faculty. Thank you all for participating this evening. I'm thrilled to moderate tonight's discussion on the topic of baseball a sport that shaped my early years, my college experience at Pace, my professional life. And I do want to do a special shout out to Coach Fred Calicone. Thank you, Coach, for all you did. May you rest in peace. In our conversation this evening, along with our special guests who introduced themselves shortly, we will share our experiences, expertise, and views on these four topics. Number one, we're going to talk about baseball and the low enrollment in youth sports what it is, what's causing it, and what is the role of Major League Baseball? Second topic is we're gonna talk about launch angle. What is it? Talk about some of the Major League stats and its effect on youth participation. Number three, we're gonna talk about who's coaching our kids and then parent support. And lastly, if we have time, which we think we will, we're gonna talk about COVID and baseball and the effect of the pandemic. So by way of introduction, again, I'm TJ McDonald. I live in Ridgefield, Connecticut, been happily married for 33 years. I have four sons, they're all athletes. We're all older now. I coach baseball for over 20 years and I currently work in the healthcare industry. I'm very proud to be a Pace Athletic Hall of Famer and a recipient of the Peter Xfinity Award for Leadership. I'm currently serving as the chair of the Pace Athletic Alumni Board with a mission to advance the student athlete experience at Pace. We just concluded our second year. I'm very proud of our accomplishments. As someone who recognizes the importance of sports in our lives and how Pace Athletics has tra been transformational for me, I know that Pace is a link for all of us here tonight. In that spirit, I invite you to join me in support of our student athletes at Pace by becoming a member of the Pace Setters Club. I'll be happy to share the link following tonight's event. This evening's event features Rick Wolf, and that's with two Fs, an expert in the field of sports psychology and sports parenting. Coach Wolf hosts a WFAN weekly radio show on Sunday mornings called Rick Wolf Sports Edge. Coach Wolf's website is askcoachwolf.com, and you can follow Coach Wolf on Twitter at hashtag AskCoachWolf. Again, two Fs. Also featured this evening is Pace alumnus Kevin Gallagher, the author of the new book, Teach Your Kids to Hit So They Don't Quit. It's a great read. Kevin is a former Pace setter baseball player and a Hall of Famer who also played professionally. I'd like to thank our two special guests, Kevin and Rick, for joining us tonight and invite them to say a few words before we dive into our topics. Kevin, let's start with you, please. Thank you, TJ. Hi, everybody. Uh, Kevin Gallagher. Um, TJ kind of touched on it all. I'd just like to touch on um, professional playing. So I want everyone to know I, I did sign with the Pittsburgh Pirates, um, and I lasted about a week. <laughs> I got hurt. My career ended. Um, so I, I never talk about that too much because it wasn't a lengthy career. But nonetheless, I was I was signed, and um, I got hurt early, and um, that stung me for many, many years. But uh, I've written that book that um, – TJ talks about it's kind of rekindled my whole uh, enthusiasm for the sport, and um, I'm, in, I'm excited to be here tonight. Thank you. And Rick? <laughs> TJ, first of all, thank you for that kind uh, introduction. And uh, Kevin, of course, uh, you know, we've been friends for a long, long, long time. And Kevin's book really is terrific. We'll talk more about that later on in terms of how to teach kids. Uh, the game of baseball. Um, my roots with Pace 
go back, I believe, to 1977. It was my first coaching job. I was an assistant coach at Pace uh, under Gene Westmoreland. Um, and I know that uh, Pace has had a tremendous, tremendous history of great baseball. I, I've spent a year at Pace, then went on to become the head coach at uh, Mercy College over in Dobbs Ferry. We had great battles. Uh, myself, uh, Fred Calicone, uh, one of the great all-time coaches, and of course, uh, the Pace tradition has continued these days with Hank Manning. Um, but I have only wonderful, wonderful memories of Pace. Uh, TJ, I wonder if you're going to talk at all about that old, not the field today, which is beautiful, but the original Pace baseball field, where the fences were about 200 feet away. <laughs> I, mean, I remember that first year of coaching at Pace, uh, and for your old timers, you recall, it was like an, a Little League baseball field. I think Pace in those days was Division Three, and they always led the nation in scoring because I mean, everybody hit home runs all the time. It was extraordinary. And the team they had the year I was there, I mean, they had some great players. I remember they had uh, Freddie DeVito and, and Ronnie Lindbergh and his brother, um, Freddie Pistano, Bobby Griner. This is, these are quality baseball players, but that field was something special. It was. There was equal opportunity to hit home runs in that short fence. So, uh, yeah, it was beneficial. Yeah, but Pace, Pace played their half their games there. <laughs> <laughs> all good. It's all good. So, <laughs> so Kevin and Rick, thanks so much. Um, I want to dive into the first topic. And again, folks, as we go through this, if you have a question, um, Drew Brown is going to send to me questions that um, are germane to the specific topic. And as I come up, we'll, uh, we'll interject a few. So, Talking about enrollment, I'm going to go back 10 years, and when I was at, even further, when I was in Chicago, I lived out there for th 13 years, and I was a coach for little, you know, little guys. My guys were 8, 9, 10, 11, and what we noticed year over year in the league was that the enrollment was going down, and at that time, there was a huge upswell in lacrosse, and it was taking a lot of our really good baseball players who, in my estimation, they were just maybe bored with baseball but it was just a, a trend that was not, you know, something I really liked to see. So we tried a whole lot of different things with clinics and stuff like that. But Rick, I know that you've got more insight into this and, and I know the audience would be very interested in hearing more about your know, relationship with Major League Baseball and, and how it all fits together. So um, let's open up discussion with your thoughts, please. Well, uh, like everybody who grew up on baseball as a national pastime, I become increasingly concerned that the sport is not being marketed in an attractive way to the next generation of athletes. Uh, I, mean, I don't care whether you're in New York or in Chicago or anywhere in this country. These days, if you want to punish a youngster when they're six or eight or 10 years old, you say to them, okay, we're going to go out to the baseball diamond and uh, the, the coach is going to throw batting practice. Everybody else go out in the outfield and stand around for two hours and do nothing while you shag flies. That is just brutal. As I said, it's a, it's a form of, I think, uh, punishment because kids today, as you pointed out, TJ, have grown up on sports that are fast afoot, whether it's lacrosse or soccer or ice hockey or basketball. They, the idea of going out there and just playing a so-called cerebral game does not in any way appeal to them. So I would start, uh, and again, we can talk about this later on, but Major League Baseball seems to be going in the opposite direction in terms of trying to make this game attractive to kids. First thing I would do is, is have uh, coaches teach kids, uh, go through their paces of practice. Every drill skill takes maybe five, 10 minutes, move on to something else, but you keep the kids moving constantly, whether it's learning how to hit a baseball or catch a ball or field a ball or throw strikes, but keep them moving so they don't get bored. And, and uh, beyond that, as many of you, of you know, the Major League Baseball is in the process of eliminating 40 minor league baseball teams for next year, 40. That's like one third of all the current teams. So they're gonna get rid of all the grassroots support for minor league baseball. I mean, it's just criminal what they're doing because I think the owners are in it for the short term. They really don't care about the attraction of the sport in the long term. And again, uh, and Kevin and I have talked about this all the time, you know, hitting is the most difficult thing to do in any sport. Hitting a baseball is real hard and kids get frustrated real fast. So unless they're taught the right way how to hit a baseball when they're five, six, seven years old, they're just gonna say, ah, 
this is hard. I quit. I'll do something else. And and that's one of the things that that Kevin's book is so is so appealing about it because he finally somebody's finally written a book on how to teach kids how to hit the right way. Yeah, I, I, I there's a lot to it, and I, I think about if we look in our background, and, and and Kevin would love your opinion. If I look at our background, we just went out and played, you know. And I think about distractions. I think about. Um, you know, is there a place to play stickball, wiffle ball, or so many distractions today? And it's, you know, the thing is, all the sports are like this, but you have to be scheduled to play. Yep. So I look at it and I go, you know, who's out there just playing? Kevin, you got some thoughts? Yeah, like Rick was saying, you don't need to be a genius to ride by the high school field or the sand lot or the little league field. They're not out there playing, you know. Um, stickball, they're not playing stickball. Um, and, you know, there's a statistic that we, we shared, Rick, that, the National Sporting Goods Association has said that over the last 10 years that youth participation in baseball between the ages of 7 and 11 is down 31%. And between 12 and 17, it's down 36%. I mean, and I go, I go one step further. Major League Baseball, 30% of the players are foreign born. Where are, where's our youth? You know, I always like the top, the, the, the statistic that only 68 out of 882 Major League Baseball players are African American. Where's our youth? Where's Major League Baseball's fan base going to be, you know, in, in, in a few years? So um, and I, there's a lot of reasons for that. Rick hit on a couple of them. We're going to talk about the launch angle. I, that really contributes to this whole slowing the game down. The kids aren't watching. You know, there's a lot, lot to that as well. But we'll get to that in a minute. But, yeah, the kids just aren't playing the game. And Major League Baseball is going to have a problem in 10 years. So where is the base going to come from? The kids aren't playing it because everything happens so fast now. You want to talk to somebody, you text them, boom, they answer you, you know video games, boom, NBA's up and down the court. They're not going to stand around, like Rick says. Um, the games are three and a half hours long. There's a lot of, lot to talk about along that, but the launch angle has a lot to do with that, and I'll get to that when I when talk about it. And just, just to follow up on that, Kevin, you know, Major League Baseball, the way it's, it's um, played today, it's all about strikeouts and home runs, which is not the way the game was invented, and it's, quite frankly, it's boring. So why the guys are – the kids are working on the launch angle to hit home runs. They they equate a strikeout with, uh, with just well, it's just another no big deal. I struck out. That that's not how the game is played. And and you know, kids who could steal bases, which was a big deal when I was playing, when I was coaching. I mean, nobody steals bases anymore. It's become a very very uh, very stale game, and it's hard to watch. And it's hard to see how any youngster would be interested in playing. Yeah, I, I have a really good question here, and then I have a comment just relative to small ball. So the question is, do you see a correlation between the cost of traveling teams and the decrease in enrollments? Rick, you can start. I'll jump in quick. No, I don't. I don't. I think the game is not geared towards the ordinary kid. The, the, the pool of players have been shrunk down to these traveling teams, which is great. The kid has talent. We, I talk to Rick all the time about waking up at midnight in a line drive. Most kids can't. They need to be taught how to hit to stay with the game because they swing and miss too often. They're going to leave like Rick said. And baseball is the only game where four times a game, you put the kid in the spotlight. Everybody wait. All right, Joey, go ahead. What do you got? You're going to hit the ball. You're going to miss it. And if he swings and misses enough, he's, he's you know, with his girlfriend in the stands or the, his buddies, he's quitting the game. We need more of an emphasis on hitting the baseball and teaching the ordinary kid so we expand the base of, of uh, who's playing. Rick? No, I, I 100% agree with that, Kevin. Um, you know, travel teams, club teams have become, it's a now, according to Time Magazine, uh, it's a 17 billion, with a B, billion dollar industry in this country. To give you some perspective, Major League Baseball is a nine billion dollar industry. So the youth level, uh, travel teams, club teams, it's 17 billion. Somebody is obviously making money off this. Uh, mm -hmm. What I do get worried about is the fact that, again, once a kid shows some athletic ability, and gets onto a club or travel team, what kind of instruction are they getting? I mean, these kids look great. They look they're bigger and stronger, and they look great in the uniforms. They're all decked out. But when you ask them about, you know, inside baseball, you know, like, how, how are you going to move this runner along? Can you put a bunt down? Can you throw strikes? They, they don't have those skills because they haven't grown up working on those, those abilities, and it's a real problem. And, um, again, because baseball is base, it's – it's predicated on failure. How do you get kids to understand this is the hardest sport to play and that you're going to fail most of the time? It's a real tough, it's a real tough sell. You know, if you do it, 
baseball, like you said, Rick, the way parents teach, you take them to the ballpark, you give them, first thing you do is we give them a bat and we throw the ball to them. No, very little instruction outside of where you stand. If you took your kids skiing, you wouldn't take them to the top of the mountain, put skis on them and say, go ski, you give them lessons. You know, you golf, <laughs> you don't play 18 holes, you give them lessons. And in golf, the boys are sitting there for crying out loud. In baseball, it's coming. And we don't give them instructions. You know, we just throw the ball to them and we hope they hit it. So I wrote a book all about that, um, how to teach the kid to hit a very simple process to the parent. But, you know, we got to give them instructions so that they have fun, they slide into second, they get dirty, and they want to come back tomorrow. Yeah, I agree with that. The, 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 the litmus test for any kid who plays baseball is whether or not after the season's over, if they want to come back and play again next year. Yeah. Because, again, it isn't, it's a different kind of animal. Uh, as we all know, if you fail seven times out of ten at the plate, you're going to have Hall of Fame numbers. There are very few other sports where you can fail so much and be considered a success. Um, and again, I, I don't understand why Major League Baseball continues just to, I mean, for example, as I said, now they're trying to get rid of all these minor league teams. Uh, they're trying to consolidate everything from youth baseball, little league baseball, to high school and college baseball under Major League Baseball. I'm not really quite sure why they're doing that because from what I can tell, Major League Baseball has been pretty successful, but uh, it, is, it is very, very troubling uh, that they're trying to basically reinvent something that's worked for well over 100 years. Uh, I, I would think they'd be better off trying to sell the game uh, and just how, how challenging it is to, to, to sell to kids. Like, look, your friends can play soccer and football and basketball, but if you want to be considered an elite or a superior athlete, try your hand playing baseball. I mean, use the example of Michael Jordan, perhaps the greatest basketball player of all time, when he took a year off to go play baseball in double A, he hit like uh, 210 and um, walked away from the game realizing it was too tough to play and went back to basketball. Yeah, there's a lot of sports out there, TJ, that kids can run around for two hours and you don't know if they did good or bad. And there's, you know, they participate, they blend in. But to Rick's point, it's, it's a very difficult sport and um, it's, it's, it's why kids quit early. And so we need to teach them how to hit, you know. Another question here. Um, are you seeing the same decline trends in softball as in baseball? Asking as a father of two girls. Um, I don't have statistics for that, but I'll tell you what. It's a bat and it's a ball. And it's about teaching them how to hit the ball. And the ball is coming in in Little League and softball, the same, same thing is coming in on a straight line. So if, you, if you're not teaching them properly and if they're not uh, learning how to hit properly, they're going to probably wind up having the same difficulties. Now, I don't know about the decline, but the game is the same when, when you get down to that level. I can speak just anecdotally that uh, I don't have an empirical numbers in front of me, but I do know from talking to coaches over the last 10 years, uh, depending on where you live, uh, softball in many places, particularly in parts of Westchester County, the numbers have gone down dramatically. Uh, some high schools now are combining uh, their softball yeah. players to form one team. If you're in Jersey, softball is at an all-time rate of popularity. Connecticut is sort of half and half. So it really depends where you are, but uh, softball sort of has the same kind of issues that, that, that baseball has. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sad. Okay. I'm, I'm going to ask one more question, ask for comment, and then we're going to move on to the next topic. And uh, thanks for everybody for, for sending in your comments. Um, this is something that is a, is a huge debate. And, and it's, you know, why do kids today have to pick one sport so early on? You know, we're not developing the athlete anymore where you're a multi-sport player and you get muscles from every different which way. Now you're a specialist. Any comments on that? Well, I'll, I'll tell you that I, I think the whole idea of specialization, it's a myth. And it's something that every orthopedic surgeon uh, will tell you that kids should not do that. Um, because if you specialize in one sport all year round, uh, you're going to run the real serious risk of um, uh, repetitive use injury, which is a term that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago, but it's very common these days. Because if you do the same thing over and over and over again, eventually your body is going to break down. The other concern, quite frankly, is burnout. When kids play one sport all year round, let's say they play soccer all year round, well, that's great and their enthusiasm is, is at an all-time high, but at some point they begin to sort of say, you know, this is no longer so much play, it's now become work. I have an obligation to go yeah. to practice every day, or I have an obligation to play in these games. 
And uh, back in the day when he had three sport athletes, they didn't have burnout. They did not have repetitive use injury issues. Um, and the fact is, most of your top athletes, and I understand why so many parents want their kids to specialize. They feel if they start specializing in one sport where they're six or eight or 10, that in the long run, they're going to have a leg up on their peers. But the reality is, if you look at all the top pro athletes, all of these guys and gals, that they didn't, they didn't specialize in one sport until they were probably a sophomore in high school when they were like 15. So they didn't have to specialize because all the skills they learned from whether it was soccer or basketball or baseball, all those skills translated in, into the other sports they were playing. So again, there's a great temptation to specialize, but it may be, um, it may just go lead to a, a dead end in the long run. Don't be kids and parents have to be very wary about specializing at the early age. PJ, just real quick on that too. When we have kids play sports, it's, it's parenting. We're parenting children all the time, no matter what we do. And when we bring them into sports, we're parenting them as well. And oftentimes when you have them specialize in a sport, there's a lot of pressure there to do well in that sport. And kids are looking to have fun. And, um, you know, we, we sometimes confuse what our view of success is with the kids' view of success. And our, our view sometimes as a parent is to be, be the best, hit the home run, win the game. Well, and the kid just wants to get on base and slide in a second, get dirty and talk about the game later with his friends. You know, I often said I'd want my kid, he may not be the best kid out there, but I, I want him to be the happiest kid. Yeah, and that's fair. And the quick story I'll share is my, my uh, youngest son, a uh, very good baseball player. And when we got to senior year, he finished out of season. He said, Dad, he says, I don't want a second job in college. And, and it's unfortunate that he looked at it that way. But that's the reality. He said, I want to play the game because I love to play the game, but I don't see that in the future. So, again, thanks for the questions, comments, and um, Rick and Kevin for your, your insights and expertise and um, your points of view. Moving on to a topic I think uh, most of us really enjoy hitting and love to hit. When do I get up to the plate? And Kevin, I'd love to, to have you just quickly explain to the audience if they don't know what a launch angle is. I know some of us have the vernacular from the old times, a little different terminology. Um, launch angle, um, what it is, um, going over some of the stats, which were absolutely amazing to me, especially um, Hank Aaron and... Uh, Willie Mays relative to their stats compared to today's stats. And then, uh, you know, how it's affecting youth baseball. Yeah, thank you. So the launch angle, you'll probably know what it is. I'll just describe it to you. So the launch angle is the, I wouldn't say it's a fair, but it's been around the last five, eight years. Actually, Ted Williams was the one who introduced it, but it went away for a while. But um, it's a swing that's designed to become up. And when you hit the ball, the ball goes up and goes hopefully far. Uh, that's what the launch angle swing is. In order to accomplish that, you have to start with your bat here, and about the barrel of the bat goes underneath the plane of the ball, which is coming in on this line, and you're coming up. And geometry will tell you that there's only one intersection point, right? There's only one spot where you can hit it that way. Whereas you hit, use top hand hitting, level swing, contact hitting like Rick did, and you, know, you have to bat on the same plane of the ball for a longer period of time, creating multiple points of contact. So the launch angle swing um, has revolutionized the game. And today you got players that are hitting 30 home runs and making a lot of money. But these guys that are hitting 30 home runs are striking out 175, 200, 225 times a game. You know, guys like um, um, Paul Goldsmith had 33 home runs. He struck out 175 times. Bryce Harper had 36 home runs. He struck out 175 times. Giancarlo Stanton struck out 211 times or something. You know, he hit 38 home runs. And to TJ's point, um, guys like Mays and Aaron, who were contact hitters, believe it or not, they got on top of the ball with that hand when um, they averaged 66 strikeouts a season over 20 years and averaged 36 mm -hmm. runs a year. So, but the launch angle is what, more importantly, what the launch angle has done, it's, it's slowed the game down because there's all, nothing but strikes, strikeouts, walks, and, and, and home runs. 34% of the game today is between the pitcher and the catcher and the batter. It's either a home run, strikeout, or, or a walk. It's kind of boring. Did you know, this is when it kills me, there's three minutes and 40 seconds between balls put in play in, in the major leagues. Three minutes and 40 seconds, we, we want our kids to watch the games. I, I always say you can make a bologna sandwich, walk the dog, come back in, the same guys at bat. Now I understand the game, so do you. They're going in, they're going out, but um, the, the games are longer. They're three hours and five minutes. They're ending 11 o'clock at night. So the, the, this whole launch angle has done something to the game. It's, 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 it's changed it to where people aren't watching the game. So the kids aren't invested in the game by watching it with mom and dad at night, 
Um, it's 11 o'clock, they're, they're ending. It's, it's boring. There's a lot of downtime in the game. When they go to the ballpark and they swing and miss without instruction, um, they're going to quit the game because they're not investing it to begin with. So the, the, the launch angle is a swing that kids can develop very early too, just because the bat's too heavy, as Rick knows. Um, and without instruction, uh, well, actually with today, a lot of the coaches are teaching launch angle. Swing up, son, swing up. And there's only one spot to hit the ball. And they're going to have many, many, many more swings and misses. The pros don't mind because they, they, they make a lot of money. But, I, but I, in my book, I say the longest and loneliest walk in sports is the walk from home plate back to the dugout with your bat on your shoulder again after you struck out. And the launch angle will contribute to many, many swings and misses. And that's part of what's changed this game, Rick. It's uh, slowed the game down as opposed to putting the ball in play, hit and run. Triple, the triple is the most exciting game in the, play in the game. You know, but you got to put the ball in play. So that's what the launch angle is. That's what's going on today with it. And um, I think it's had a very detrimental effect. Kevin, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you know, it's funny. Back in the 1920s, 1930s, uh, the typical major league game, nine inning game, lasted about two hours. And nowadays, of course, it's four hours. Uh, yes, of course, a lot has to do with the fact that there are, they didn't have many relief pitchers back in the 20s and 30s. Uh, they didn't have a two, two and a half minute commercial break between every half inning to, to sell products and beer and stuff. But the fact remains that uh, now Major League Baseball is trying to find a way to get pitchers to get the ball back from the catcher and pitch right away to speed up the game. And as you said, you know, to strike out, I mean, that takes time. You got to see three pitches before uh, you can be whiffed and sent back to the dugout. But the game of baseball was not designed that way. The game of baseball was designed to put the ball into play so that everybody is active all the time. Um, I can recall some years ago when my son, uh, who was a ball player, was about eight or nine, and I went down to uh, the local Little League field where I live in Armont, and um, it was in the fall, so the field wasn't being used. And I just told uh, my son, John, get a bunch of your buddies together. We're going to go out on the field. We'll divide into two teams, just pick up teams. And I'll go out and I'll pitch. And I'll make sure everybody can hit. And basically, we'll put the ball into play. And so within, there were no umpires, no parents, no scoreboard. It was sort of like Sandlot baseball. The kids didn't have any uniforms on. They just were, you know, hitting and uh, as I said, I made sure every kid hit the ball. I pitched appropriately to them. And all of a sudden, the kids discovered a whole new sport. The ball was hitting the, was put in the play. Kids were making fields. Kids, kids were laughing. Kids were running the bases. It was like, my gosh, this is fun. But it, it was a totally different animal to what they've been accustomed to with Little League Baseball, where, as I mentioned early on, you stand around the outfield and do nothing. This was games where they were running, laughing, uh, giving each other, you know, a hard time, rising each other. It was, it was real baseball. But those days are gone. It just doesn't happen because it's not sold in that manner. And, again, as long as we continue on this pathway with players being told that if they hit a lot of home runs, you know, with your launch angle, don't worry about striking out 200 times a year. You'll make your money. But, it, it, it's, you know, we're going to really kill the golden goose here because, again, Major League Baseball, they decided some years ago, We'll start the games at 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. Well, kids fall asleep by 9 o'clock. They're not going to watch the games. Uh, World Series games, start them late too. I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. What, what are these guys thinking of if they want to, you know, basically keep the game going in a positive way? It's just very hard to fathom. And, and TJ, one of the things that everybody on this call will relate to, and I say this, for, at least for, for me, I, I watch these games, and it's frustrating as hell to see how many check swings there are in baseball today. How many check swings at the low outside slider in the dirt, the strike, and strike three on it? It's, it's an epidemic of it. And I attribute that to the launch angle as well, because as I said before, the launch angle is a long swing. It starts, goes loops down, has to come back up. And there's only one spot to hit the ball, and he pitches it throwing 95, so they got to start their swing sooner. And when they swing sooner, they commit sooner. When that ball breaks uh, halfway in or three quarters of the way in, they can't hold up, and you get that, that, that half swing and you're out and, and you're like, how can these guys be swinging at that pitch in the dirt? The launch angle is the reason for it. And I just want to make, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, well, it's going in and out. So um, a question for you. And a few years back, the California Angels won World Series playing 
an old version of small ball. It was a co combination of, uh, I forget the coach's name, the manager's name, but, you know, they surprised everybody. And they played the complete game. And the best I can recollect was the last time that we saw a true small ball team. And they had the components. Do you think we'll ever see small ball come back? Do you think we'll see a innovative manager saying, you know what, I, I'm in sync with the Kevins and the Ricks and the TJs and others of the world. I'm going to put a different team on the, on the field. Rick and I are out to save baseball. That's what we're trying to do here. Um, <laughs> actually, the, the, um, the, the, the 2015 Kansas City Royals played that type of, they beat the Mets that year. They played that, put the ball in play, put pressure on it, keep moving, steal bases. You know, that's, yeah. that's how they played it. And um, um, so it's, it's, it hasn't gone away. I, Rico Petroselli, Rick, he wrote an endorsement in my book, and he talks about back when he played, they used the top hand hitting, contact hitting, and, he's, and it doesn't take power away. It doesn't. He hit 40 home runs, the first shortstop in American League history to hit it. He said Yastrzemski used it. He said, do you remember Hawk Harrelson? He said Hawk Harrelson used it. Uh, they taught that uh, back, back then, and they all hit 40 home runs that were better. So it doesn't necessarily take away power. It's more of a gap type of swing, but you can hit home runs as well. You hit the ball, you hit the ball right, it's going. But um, I, I think it's coming back. I do, and that's why I wrote the book, and I said it in the book, that Major League Baseball needs to pay attention to their fan base. It's eroding. You need to put action back in the game, as Rick's saying. And they'll come to that conclusion. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this too, uh, TJ. I do think, I do think we're going to see a, a reversal that I think the whole wave uh, in the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, some sabermetrics uh, to, you know, launch angles, Somebody somewhere, whether like as, as Kevin mentioned, the, the Kansas City Royals did it a few years ago. Um, somebody somewhere is going to say, you know what? Let's get back to small ball. Let's get back to old time baseball. Let's get back to guys who can run, guys who can move runners along, guys who don't strike out, put the ball in play, pitchers who throw strikes, not necessarily uh, 100 miles an hour. Uh, you think I, like a guy, Greg Maddox who, you know, really never broke 90 miles an hour, the Hall of Famer, because he could throw strikes and change speeds. Somebody somewhere is going to do this, and the only question will be, will it be too late or too little too late to attract fans back to the ballparks? Because I, I do have a sense, once this pandemic is done, you know, teams may have a hard time getting fans back in the stands because they realize it's, it's a kind of a, a boring game these days that they're offering at the major league level. Yeah, that would be unfortunate. Um, you know, going, going back to uh, launch angle and hitting home runs, I, I think it was Hank Aaron that said, because I don't have to hit the ball 500 feet. I just have to hit the ball one foot further than the fence. <laughs> right? And, and that tells you the truth. And he was, he was a wonderful hitter. Um, he, nice, easy swing, and boom, next thing you know, 700 and some odd you know, home runs. You know, wonderful swing, great batting average. So... I was watching uh, some clips of Roberto Clemente the other day. It was an anniversary of his, and, and he, he was another guy. He got, he got on top of the ball, put the ball in, in play. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, that I, it's definitely going to come back, in my opinion. So. Well, I can tell you from personal experience coaching against TJ when uh, I was coaching at Mercy, and we had some pretty good ball clubs there. And TJ, to this day, I still don't know how to pitch you because you had great power but you also had great wrist, wrist uh, strength and you had a very quick stroke. And, you know, if you're an opposing coach and you're, you're, you go out to the mound and talk to your pitcher, and he says, what do I throw this guy? I say, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> Just uh, throw him something he can't over the fence. Because it was, it was really, really <laughs> tough to pitch against T.J. McDonald, I can tell you that. Yeah, I was, I was talking to Yogi Berra a few years back, and he, he told the story about uh, Buddy Ford was pitching and the game started and the first guy hit a double – on the first pitch, next pitch guy hit a triple, and the next guy hit a home run, and Casey comes out, and they go out with Yogi to the pitcher, and he looks at Yogi, and, and he says, how's it look? He says, I don't know. I haven't caught one yet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Pete Rose also said, he said, um, home runs are up, and strikeouts are up, but attendance is down. He said, I didn't go to Harvard. It's not a good thing. <laughs> right. Good thing, he said, so. Right, and that, that message is, it's still about the money and the, the corporate ship of it, but uh, uh, Rick, thank you for those compliments. Those uh, I miss those days. Um, I wish I could still play. All right, uh, folks, you know, if you have questions about a launch angle or um, other questions, fire away. Uh, let's move to the next topic. And Rick, I'm going to come back to you. Um, as a person who coached for 20 years, you know, I know a lot about baseball, know all the bits and pieces, just couldn't tell somebody how to throw a proper curveball. 
Um, I don't think I was a really good coach. One of the things that uh, Kevin had put in his book was that, you know, even though you could do it, you still have to communicate. You have to use the right language. You have to have that right relationship with the player. And today we have a lot of really good baseball players coaching their kids, but we also have, you know, folks that are wanting to be participatory because if they coach their kid gets to play. Um, let's dig into the topic about who's coaching our kids today. What value are they getting out of, you know, the folks that are just pushing to get to the top, just general comments about who's coaching it. And then also talk about parental support, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, as you know, I've, I've, I could speak hours on this topic. Um, clearly, uh, daddy ball has been around for a long time at the youth level. Uh, dads and of course there are moms as well uh, but obviously they want to see their, their kids be the star of the team they want the kid to be the bat third or be the pitcher play shortstop whatever it might be uh, that still exists although I do think we over the last uh, 20 years have hammered the point down to, to parents today that it's not just about your kid uh, you have to treat all the kids in your team equally and give them all a fair chance and let them all rotate around positions and different parts of the batting order uh, to, to let them see what it's like to be in on a ball club. Um, but of course, it's still, it's still part of the issue today where, where parents are more than ever are, are very much involved in their kids' athletic success. And that's probably due to the fact that, as we mentioned early on, if a kid shows some, some signs of athletic talent, by the time they're nine or 10, they now have migrated from the local rec program uh, to uh, a travel or club team, which costs real money. And, the, you know, being a team, it, the, the cost can go from anywhere from 2000 to $10,000 a year. And at that level, you know, most of the parents want to make sure their kid is really getting a chance to get a lot of playing time, play the position they want, and, and so on and so forth. And they want the coaches say only good things about their kids' progress. Uh, this is a, a huge concern because at some point the reality kicks in. At some point a kid gets to be, I don't know, 13 or 14 and realizes they aren't that good or they're not going to be able to hit a 94 hour fastball over the fence. And then all of a sudden the frustration begins to erupt and there can be real friction with the, the kid and their parent or with the coach. So it, it's a very, very dicey, tricky situation. Uh, and coaches today, well, they got, they got to be uh, well-schooled in the psychology of working with young kids. And kids today really expect praise. They want praise. And they do not react well to old-school, uh, you know, hard-in-your-face kind of coaching. They want to be told how great they are, no matter how poorly they're doing. Yeah, I'll a... jump in too. You know, most coaches at the lower levels, anyway, the way they coach, um, number one, they're just parents. A lot of parents don't know how to coach, so they put them off to a little league coach. That's just somebody else's parent that really doesn't know how to teach a kid to hit. They, they pretty much get the kids out there and they all grab a bat, they throw a batting practice, and, and he takes notice who hits it, who doesn't. And then he figures his lineup out. I'll play these kids, they're good. No instruction, right? So they really don't know how to teach hitting. Um, but what happens to the, those marginal kids is, you know, they want to play the game too, and no one's really teaching them. And I always say there's kids all across America screaming out, I want to play this game, won't somebody teach me? But they wind up at the end of the bench, they wind up maybe not making the team, you know, it has an effect on these guys. And I believe that some of the best soccer players out there, the best lacrosse players out there, could have been wonderful baseball players, but they left too soon because they did not, no one taught them how to play the game. And so I think it's a, a you know, incumbent on us to make sure we, we do teach them um, how to hit. Because uh, it does have effects. And Rick, I'm going to take one second on this. You know, it, it affects kids' self-esteem. You know, they don't make the, the, the team. They're at the end of the bench. They're embarrassed by, 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 by striking out. It affects who they are, how they think, their self-esteem, their confidence. It affects yeah. the friends they hang out with. Maybe they don't have to, they're not with the cool guys or the girl they date. But maybe it affects the, what do they do the next time a, a situation comes up? Do they take a chance? Or they, yeah, I might fail. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll end with this. And I, and I know you know this, Rick, but when I wrote this book, Teach Your Kid the Hits, They Don't Quit, I got a lot of emails and, and, and responses. The first response floored me. And it was, it was seven words. And those seven words were, thank you, Kevin. I am that kid. 
It was a 64-year-old man who didn't say I was that kid. I am that kid. He remembered be, not being able to make the team, wanting so desperately to play. Nobody taught him how to play. He wound up at the end of the bench, got cut. It affected his life. It, he remembers still to this day. And so I really, that's why I might focus on that book and what I'm talking about here is the ordinary kid. Because that ordinary kid could become the major leaguer too, or not. But he can have a couple of years playing the game for fun. And, um, and that's why it's, I'm so passionate about um, what, what I'm doing now, trying to make sure the ordinary kid gets the attention and not just the exceptional kids. TJ, you were exceptional. Ricky, you were exceptional. I was pretty good. The other kids needed attention as well. Well, to that point, Kevin, this is not often talked about, uh, but you're absolutely right. A generation ago, the kids who grew up playing baseball or basketball, soccer, football, whatever, they, their greatest aspiration was to make the high school varsity team. And that's all they lived for when they were 11, 12, 13 years old in middle school. But these days in society, if you aren't designated as a star on the rise, I mean, a real superstar when you're in middle school, you begin to realize, well, what, what am I doing this for? I'm not going to be a star in high school. I'm not going to make the varsity. So I'm also, I don't want to just be a guy who's on the bench. I'm just going to quit. And this is why we see three out of four kids by the time they're age 13. Three out of four. 75% of all kids in America quit playing sports by the time they're 13 years old. That didn't happen a generation ago because kids kept dreaming. They kept wanting to keep work harding work harder and they want to get better to the point they could you know play high school sports nobody worried about getting a playing in college or pro ball they just wanted to make the high school varsity which was a big big deal in those days but now again nowadays kids say hey i'm not going to be the starting quarterback i'm not going to be the star midfielder in soccer heck with it i'll go out and do something else i'll go play video games and that's why they quit yeah, yeah. As, I said, as i said earlier tj um you know we, we sometimes as parents confuse what the kids view of success is they, they just want to have fun and sometimes we can get in the way of that, you know, by wanting him to do better and do better and do better. He went two for four. What happened to the other two times? You know, I'll tell you a story about Johnny Bench. He, he tells a story about when he was a kid, his father out in the Midwest somewhere, the town didn't have a little league team. So they got one together. They didn't have uniforms. They have t-shirts and they played whatever they could in shorts. And there was one team that won every year. They won and they were boasting and all that. And the first year they lost every game. Second year, they, they got some uniforms. They did pretty better. Third year, they got uniforms, coaching. They did well. They wound up playing the championship game. And but every, be, I, I left something out. After every game they lost, John, uh, Johnny Bench's father would say to the team, come on in here, kids. Did you try your best? Did you have fun? Let's go get a cheeseburger. After every game for three years, they play the championship game. They win the game. The other team is throwing sneakers and throwing things and crying. And, and this Johnny Bench says to his dad, dad, what's, what's wrong with those guys? And he says, well, they haven't learned how to lose yet, son. Did you have fun? Yeah. Today? Did you have a good time? Did you try your best? Yeah. Let's go get a cheeseburger. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's about having fun. You know, that, that brings up, and this is a quick one for you because I have a couple other questions after this, but um, what do you feel and how do you feel about participation trophies where everybody gets a trophy at the end of the season? Good, bad? Um, I thought I was going to get a trophy for being on the Zoom call. You're getting that. It's in the mail. <laughs> I, I, go ahead, Rick. You, you I was going to say very quickly, uh, it's a topic that always comes up on my radio show, and I will tell you that you know, if their kids are six or seven, they do get excited about getting that little trophy. But at the age, after seven, the kids figure out that this is nothing. And this, as long as your mom and dad pay the registration fee, even if you don't go to a game, if you don't go to a practice, you still get a trophy. But after that, by the time they're eight, no, let's move on. Let's move on to other, other rewards, other values that the kids really care about in terms of playing sports. And I think okay. the kids always need encouragement. Win, lose, tire, draw. It doesn't need to be a trophy, but yeah. we're parenting our kids through all this. And so they need to be encouraged. They, they, they need to, even when they lose, they need to point out what, maybe what they did wrong, how we could do better. You did your best you could. Always, a trophy isn't really the encouragement they need. They need the parenting and the interaction to understand, you know, like I said, like Johnny Betts' father said, they haven't learned how to lose yet. Learning how to lose is the most, one of the most important things on a sports field, any, any field. So they need encouragement without a doubt. But trophies, eh. Well, yeah, you know what happens to your trophies, TJ? How many trophies do you have, Rick? The heads are off now. The, the guy's got one arm. You still have it. They all fall apart anyway. So. I remember watching a gentleman, um, and, and he did this on his own, and I just I listened to him. He brought all the parents together, and he says, I'm going to have to do my most coaching with you, the parents. I got the kids. And I learned from that beginning of the season is to talk to parents about 
you know, what you bring to the table and their support and their role, which is, listen, there's going to be winners, there's going to be losers, there's going to be good day, bad day. We want your kid to come back tomorrow. And by the way, you're the biggest part of that. Yeah. So that was a great piece of advice that I got along the way that just, you know, I stuck with me and put it in every year, a new team I get to go, listen, it's going to happen. It's going to be what's going to be, but we need you to have your kid come back tomorrow. We're good coaches and travel teams. It says, you know, we're the coach. We got three guys that do major disciplines. Your kid's going to get coached. So um, yeah, good stuff. Listen, I want to get to a couple of the call, a couple other questions. Um, I'll read it to you. Play to play has ruined this game. If you look at the club ball 10 years ago and club ball now, the amount of teams and the decrease in talent is astronomical. So how do we take back the best part of the game and make it the best of the best again, instead of watering down pay to play system, instead of a watered down pay to play system. This goes back to the travel teams and the one thing with the kids, sometimes, you know, they bring a buddy, you know, the parent calls the other parents and say, hey, can you get my little kid to join your kid and go play and they play. One of them's good. He leaves, go play travel. The other kid is missing his friend. Right. It's, you know, he's moving away. He goes, oh, well, Johnny's not playing anymore on the team. He's playing travel. But anyway, this, this watered down. And any thoughts there? Well, I, I have been a, a, an outspoken critic of pay for play for many years. Uh, I do think, and this is hard to, to comprehend, but the whole travel club sports industry, not just baseball, softball, or all sports, it is totally unregulated. Uh, no state or federal uh, body overlooks or oversees any of this stuff, which means that anybody anywhere can put out a shingle and saying they're starting a club or travel team. They can charge whatever they want. They can decide how tryouts are done. It's really the wild, wild west. And I've campaigned for a long time that really should be some sort of like commissioner of youth sports who can watch over all this stuff because pay for play inherently only benefits parents or families that have money. Uh, if you're a middle class family, and it costs, you know, three thousand dollars to be on a soccer travel team. Well, you may not have three thousand dollars sitting around, so your kid doesn't play in that that travel or club mm -hmm. team. That's inherently unfair, and it also ruins the, the development of sports in our in our country. So uh, I think the whole industry has to be really uh, become much more transparent. Um, and I do believe that it'd be great if we get back to sort of a grassroots. Uh, you know, play the game the right way, play old school baseball, uh, that might, again, if that happens, that might uh, attract a whole new audience for the game of baseball. Well put, Rick. Yeah, I, I think that there is a, uh, uh, an absolute need for what I'll call regional support for keeping really good players local. And, and it's a tough thing to do. Um, because the attraction and the marketing and the sales and where the eyes go to view potential for whether it's, you know, college or beyond, that's what everybody's marching to. It's that promise of, you know, their child moving to the next level with, you know, scholarships and other accolades that come with, you know, the promise of those programs. So, so thanks for the comment. I'm going to, uh, this is another one. Um, interesting. As a father of a three-year-old boy, and someone who played right before the era of everything being recorded, what effect are you seeing on these kids of every move being recorded? Well, I'll tell you, I, I don't have a problem with kids being videotaped because I happen to believe uh, that video is an extraordinarily uh, solid way to get kids to evaluate and to see for themselves what they're doing right and what needs to be worked upon. I mean, I, I came from a time where if there was any film or footage of myself in action, it was extraordinarily valuable, but it, it, was, it wasn't all that helpful because you really couldn't watch it in slow motion or see how your swing needed to be changed or how you feel the ball. But these days, every, every pro ball player, every college ball player has grown up with videotape, and I think it's a great tool. Um, and quite frankly, it's just the way it is because every cell phone has a video component on it. If you're a parent today, understand your kid is going to expect to watch him or herself on video. And as I said, if it's done the right way and taught the right way, they can learn a lot to improve their game. Yeah, vi visual uh, learning is, is very important. You can tell somebody something over and over and over. I remember the first time I was doing something, not baseball, but 
I looked at some of your films and I looked at myself doing it. And I said, I had no idea I was doing that. You know, yeah. well, the visual aid is very, very important. And going back to my book with the eight step process in the back, I, it's written, it's, there's illustrations and there's a vi video for each of the steps. So if the parent doesn't understand it, he can actually see it. Yeah, when you see something, Rick, you, you, you absorb it differently than when you just hear it. So it's a good thing, but you gotta be careful that you're not using that, going back to Rick's point about the pressure we put on kids, you know, but it can't be that serious, you know? Um, especially for the ordinary kids, you know, 8, 10, 11, 12, going into high school. It's got to be fun. You know, use, as, use it to help them, but not to, not to drain them, you know. When I think about some of the sessions that I've listened to and review, and Rick, like you, and Kevin, like you, I think the first time I saw my swing was in um, Fresno or one of the minor league teams I played for, and I, I didn't know what my swing looked like. And quite frankly, I didn't care, right? It was... And then there was also, you could do this. And the session I listened to was getting into stuff that I was going, I, I just can't believe I'm hearing all of this information coming to this person about their swing and what they needed to do. And I don't know if the question that was asked was about maybe that part of it, that how do you get from what's on the screen from the mouth of the instructor into the head so that they can execute? Because th this session to me was like, it, it was probably done better elsewhere, but this one was, just too much information, your front foot, your left foot, your elbow, your fist, the angle, the back and the fourth. And there was 30 things you had to work on. Next thing you know, strike one, strike two, strike three. Right? I could see at the upper level when you've mastered and have some semblance of um, mastery over your swing or over bits and pieces. But when I'm thinking about hitting, if I'm thinking about anything, most of us, we're toast. It's like Yogi said, you can't think and hit at the same time. And I never forget, I, I, after uh, I played the minors with the Tigers, I coached for several years with the Cleveland Indians as their first uh, sort of roving sports psychologist. And I remember uh, working with a young strapping first baseman in double A named Jim, Jim Tomey. And I mm -hmm. used to ask Jim, when you get in the batter's box, what are you focusing on? What are you thinking about? Are you keeping about your, 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 your posture, keeping your left elbow up? And what do you think? He says, Rick. All I have time to think about is where the ball is a good pitch or a bad pitch. That's all I can think about. And told me, you know, Hall of Famer. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a game where you have to make really rely upon your own athletic instincts. Now, that being said, to Kevin's point, and I agree with this, you know, video is important because you can finally see what you've heard about. But until you see it for yourself, only then can you then say, okay, I'm going to try to take these things that I see that I'm doing wrong fix it and put it into my, my, my batting stroke or my pitching mechanics, whatever it might be. And the, the better you are at being able to make that adaptation, the more successful you'll become. But it's hard and it does take time. There's a saying, TJ, that says, you know, tell me something, I'll probably forget it. And show me something that I might remember, it, but involve me, uh, involve me, then I'll understand it. And when I understand it, I'll mm -hmm. own it. I own it. I put it in my back pocket. I take it with me. It becomes who, who I am. A lot of guys that play ball with, on this Zoom here that were pretty good, maybe had a philosophy to see it and hit it. You know, you got you know what you're doing. Uh, we, we take kids to the ballpark, and to Rick's point, we tell them, keep your shoulder up. Step back. Step, swing harder. Don't swing so hard. All these disjointed pieces of information is not doing the kid any good. And once again, the, the process that I have at the end of that of the eight steps, the kid's going to have one fluid motion that he's not going to have to think about at all. And it's, it's going to be exactly what he needs to do. So. All right. All right. I, uh, we are just a time check here. We got four minutes left. I do have uh, one more question and then we're going to wrap it up. So um, this one I'll kick off. I'll, I'll read it and then I'll just give a couple of perspectives. Um, do you think the new age of baseball, throw harder and hit further, is a reason for dramatic increase in injuries? I'm just going to share a personal story of mine and really what I think was my learning in playing baseball it was growing up in the Bronx and playing stickball every single day the ball could bounce. And today the limitations and some of the things because they want to prevent sports injuries, to give perspective, Saturday we'd throw two, 300 pitches. We'd swing the bat 30, 40, 50 times. Sunday we would throw 250, 300 pitches. Many kids would show up. Yeah, I remember my arm hurting, but I just remember that thing built my strength and my endurance moving forward. I think today coming out of the coaching sessions, it's like it's so metric, it's so biometric, and there's all the data and 
Sometimes ignorance is bliss. You don't want to hurt the kid, but you don't want to not let him build up that long term endurance. Thoughts, guys? A minute each? Well, all I can tell you is I agree with you that, um, I mean, I, I, today's ball players, I sit there and, and listen to their injuries and scratch my head. You know, the guy's got a yeah. bit of a tweak in his calf muscle or his lat muscle is hurt after a hard swing. This is all foreign to me. I mean, I played hard. I never asked out of a game uh, because I was afraid if I asked out of a game in the minors, I would never get back in the lineup again. So, you, you know, you, you went through, played through minor injuries. Maybe today that's different because of the money that's involved. But I can tell you, I'm, I just turned 69, and I still throw batting practice on a regular basis to my son, who's in his mid-30s. So, and my arm doesn't hurt. So I, I guess whatever I did as a kid still works out today, many years later. Yeah. Yeah. I think everybody's different. Some, you know, when you're a gifted athlete, you're gifted physically as well to, to be able to, you know, you know, Cal Ripken didn't get a, a, a sprained thumb for like 20 seasons, you know what I mean? But um, it's nothing wrong with throwing harder. There's no, nothing wrong with hitting the ball farther or, 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 or harder through the infield, as long as you're doing it properly. Someone's giving you the right instruction to throw the ball that hard. So then you're not working against your body, et cetera. So um, I don't see anything wrong with any of that. It's just the proper instruction. Good, 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 good stuff. Gents, I enjoyed our time and I want to thank my fellow speakers, Kevin, Rick, and of course the base community of students, athletes, staff, alumni, parents, and friends. You know, we thank you for all you do for Pace Athletics and we hope you continue to support us. Uh, we'll follow up this evening's call with an email or two. Uh, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna send you some links, including to the Pace Club. We'll, uh, I believe we're gonna attach the, um, a link to this recording. Um, I'm hoping we're gonna do a survey. We had talked about that to get feedback from the audience relative to hey, was this enjoyable? What did you enjoy? The good, the bad, and the ugly. And feedback for if we decided maybe we'll do another one in the future. And then last but not least, I just want to put a plug. Um, you will get a notice and invitation for the next, for the Love of Sport event, which is Let's Talk Basketball. And that's going to be with Sam Smith. If you folks know Sam, he's been a Chicago reporter and author. He's worked with the Bulls. Um, he's also got a pretty significant um, association with Pace. Um, and Again, thank everybody. Thank the guests, speakers, the folks that helped put this together. This concludes our conversation. Enjoy your reading, evening, and stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, DJ. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, buddy. Thank you.